Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. My name is Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts, and I'm so happy about tonight. We love our host chat. I love our host chats, and I'm here. We're going to do full introductions later with Sensei Randy Dofan, Sensei Nicholas Suino, and Hanchi Gary Legacy, and we're going to jump right in with a question that we were we didn't really get into, but we're discussing that we want to talk about, which is, um, I'm actually going to throw it to you, Sensei Dofan, because I love the topic, and you came up with it. So why don't you throw the question our way, and then we'll do rounds. Okay, so I said you could come up with the top three. Um, if you could live in any era and country at your peak, like what age would you want to live and where would that be? And so, and why? Like, like you know, you can, everybody can pontificate on this a little bit. And let's switch it up a bit. Benson, you go first. What would be the three for you? Okay, great. Thanks, Sensei. Um, you know, we did talk about this before, so I did jot a few down. Um, the first one for me, hands down, is Okinawa. I just put 1860. You know, we believe that Atosu would have been about 30 years old then. What age would I want to be? Honestly, if I could insert this knowledge, probably like 35, 37. You know, that's a real, my knees and shoulders aren't feeling bad then. But I would really love to have Matsumura around and I'd love to have Atosu at my age. And I just want to dig in hard to what that is uh whatever it might cost me it would be worth every second and i want to go pre-meiji restoration right i want to go to that old top knot era so i'm in okinawa but i definitely want to see what you know what area were the 36 families in and, and and still perhaps and take a boat over to japan for a second so i can't imagine a better number one choice um my number two choice is brazil in the 1980s I would love to be down there. That's that, you know, Hickson and he's having his Luta Livre fights on the beach and the Machados are all young and it's like second gen and everybody's, all the cousins are fighting each other to figure out who's the best at the thing. But the technique's all been formed. Like there's an understanding in jiu-jitsu that even arm and leg triangles were never really used until the 70s. So I kind of want to go post a certain era with that. I don't want to be with the founders necessarily. I really love that second wave. And there was such an intensity and such a like machismo about proving this stuff worked. I want to be on the beach for those fights. And I want to see where I, I know where I'd fit in at the bottom, but that's, that's where I'd want to be training to rise. Um, and the third one won't surprise anybody on this call, but as a martial artist, I want to be in Los Angeles in like 1968, 69, 70, when Bruce Lee is really blowing up what that looks like in LA, when Chuck Norris is showing up there, when you've got those, they're training on driveways, but there's also a pathway into what it does for the movies. So those three for me, I can't even imagine any other areas that could touch those. Cool. So listen, one thing we forgot to say, Sean, tonight is that uh, because it's a host chat, if you have questions, put them down in the host chat. And then we will turn your camera on. We will expect your camera to come on and we will expect you to ask the question of us. Uh, but I, we only have one that's the same so far. So I'm feeling good. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Sensei Legacy, where do you want to go with this? Where are the three, three places on the earth and times and age that you would want to be? Um, well, yeah. of course... Like uh, Benson said, and you're probably going to mention, uh, I would like to have been in the Matsumura, Itosu, and Yamanichiru era, where you'd be walking down the street and somebody try to rob you, and you'd actually be able to, at its maximum, uh, try your heart out to see if it worked to see if you had the guts to bury somebody on the beach. And I know that sounds gruesome, but that's... Plus, I to face um, Matsumura face to face and see if Funakoshi was right. He said you were afraid to look into his face. He was so scary. And Itosu with his super strength and you know, I mean, he shrewd, uh, nicknamed uh, the Crane Warrior to see how she handled herself. That would be great. The next arrow would be, of course. Again, like probably uh, Sensei Suino would say, is I like to be following, um, I wouldn't want to face him, but I, Musashi era, where I could be walking around with a camera 
and watching all those fights that some say were real, some say they were not. How many, uh, what, 60 fights, no losses, except for for the time that uh, that one guy Gunnarsuke okay. okay. touched him on the shoulder and he said, you touch me, I consider myself defeated. <laughs> but um, uh, and then finally, uh, this is like out of vision maybe for everybody. Uh, I would have liked to be uh, around in the uh, Neanderthal times or you had to create weapons to uh, finding ways to kill for food and uh, keeping your clan alive and seeing the earth raw as it was as supposed to full of concrete buildings and see if there was a god back in, in those days because I often I often question you know everybody talks about Jesus and God but uh, he's at the year one, we'll say, when he was here, what happened to all the people before that? Did they go to heaven? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Um, I never contemplated the Neanderthals at all, but I got to be honest, that would be... Um, I'm not sure I want to fight one of them. I can tell you that right now. I'm not sure I want to fight one of them. You get beat <laughs> with a leg of lamb or something. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Says so, Asino, where do you go with all this crazy questioning? I love this question. <laughs> um, I'm going to save the oldest for last. So uh, I'm going to go in reverse chronological order. I would totally want to be around when Kano, Professor Kano was founding judo, when he was, when they were fighting in different schools, when he was deciding which techniques to include, right? Uh, which ones to exclude, what principles to refine, like that, uh, just, that would be amazing just for like 10 years before he called it judo and after just to be around and see how that was. Um, so 1880s, that era. Um, number two, uh, the Musashi area era. Um, uh, I would also like to see uh, Musashi fight, but I would like to converse with him. You know, there's a fair amount of stuff that was written by him and about him. And also, uh, uh, you know, he had relationships with some monks who also wrote uh, about the conversations they had and they're fascinating. I and mean, the guy was a deep thinker as well as a, as a good swordsman. Um, so that was in the, you know, he lived from 1584 to around 1645. I would love to have been around for that, especially probably the last 10 or 15 years when he had gone through his ruffian period and was starting to be intellectual as well. But the oldest is I want, I would love to have been in Mongolia when Genghis Khan was coming up and learn to ride a horse the way they did and watch how he built those phalanxes of warriors and study that whole business of, um, you know, those guys lived on horses. They lived a nomadic uh, meat eating life and they'd go in and they'd conquer these villages and they'd make them farmers. So they'd become more passive and they, they wouldn't have the same level of energy. And it was just, they were geniuses and fight, you know, you know, from a, from a little nomadic band in the middle of Mongol in the Mongolian, yeah. you know, uh, uh, flatlands, he basically conquered, all of Asia and half of Europe. I mean, holy cow, what an interesting guy he would have been to talk to, I think, right? Until he came up against the kamikaze wins. And then... Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's another story. That was the end, right? That's as far as he could go on that. Um, and I think, you know, probably, uh, you know, his empire as it went on and descended to next generations, I think it probably started to, to, uh, uh, to weaken, right? As all things do, um, you know, the, the original impetus is the strongest. So I think that would have been that would have been pretty cool. So um, that's what I got. I don't want to chip in too much before Sensei Dofen, but um, you can like um, people who carbon date bones can actually tell if someone lived before Genghis Khan or after, because after Genghis Khan, they actually had like more oxygen in their bones because he killed a tenth of the world's population. So what? environmentally, he created an impact on the atmosphere. Literally, the air people breathed after Genghis Khan had less. It was like a calling. Yeah, it's they can actually date it. Like, wow. Kind of, 
sorry. One thing I'd like to ask you since uh, at you since this week you know, is um, statement about Miyamoto Musashi is if you're interested in Miyamoto Musashi, go on YouTube and punch his name and it'll give you all his thinking and a lot of his sayings and his understandings about the arts. That's really good. I, I go there often. Same. So, so what I want to say about what Sensei Suino just said and what you said, Benson, is Genghis Khan, where are you now? <laughs> <laughs> I did probably, you can find a lot of his DNA. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I meant like we need the atmosphere changed once yeah. again. Oh, yeah. okay. I see. Because yeah. because his burial site is a mystery, right? Nobody knows where it is. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, I know think, what you're saying, Sensei Dauphin. Where, where are we getting the next good call from? If he was here, he would change the atmosphere, which would be great. Um, <laughs> Man, yeah. I want my legacy to be something like that. After Sweeno was when yeah. when when Sweeno died, uh, you know the the testosterone level of of all the men on the planet dropped by ten percent because they had no inspiration <laughs> left over. <laughs> okay, what about you, Sensei Dauphin? I have two that are different. So for me, it's 1860. My age would be around 45. Like, I just think 45 for me is like, you know, you're mature physically, you feel good. Like maybe you got some makes and pains, but they're not like they are um, later, right? They're not, they're not quite the same. True. Um, yeah. And obviously for me, Okinawa and Benson, I literally wrote down, you said 1860. It's on the piece of paper here. I wrote 1860. <laughs> and for me though, it's because Matsumori Tosu, Fanakoshi, um, Kayan Chitoku, they would have all like that golden era of Okinawa and karate was happening. I would have loved to have just seen all that, right? Happening. It would have been just before the Meiji restoration in 1868. Like, so... <clears throat> those political winds were already blowing, right? Like, you know, Okinawa was going to get taken over. They knew they were going to get taken over by Japan by that time. So it would have just been kind of wild to be around all those masters at that political time to see what it was like. Um, the other one for me is 480 BC. Um, and it would have been in Sparta in Greece, which is the time of the Battle of Thermopylae just like the agogi and that type of culture where you're a kid and they take you away and indoctrinate you into this lifestyle, this warrior lifestyle, and they force you to fight and fight and fight and fight until you can go back to your family when you're 15 or 16. And, you know, from the time you're eight until the time you're 16, all you do is get indoctrinated into this warrior lifestyle. But also that's the time of like Plato and higher thinking and, you know, all that stuff that's happening in Greece. So I, I think that would have been a really interesting time to be there and experience that type of a warrior uh, lifestyle. And then if you ever read The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, um, it's a really good book. Um, and then when you read the second one, things become a little more clear, right, about what that was about which led me to kind of delve into the history of this culture a little bit when I read those two books, which is the Ukrainians and the Cossacks. Like the Cossacks were badasses, man. Like those Ukrainian Cossacks were badasses. You're talking about people who can ride horses and, and shoot and live off the land and be outside for years, not for like, they live outside, not for like a day or two. Like they're outside living off the land and fighting and traveling and learning and doing this stuff for like months and months at a time, not just, you know, I'm going to go to battle and then I'm going to come home and get in my warm, comfy spot. Mm -hmm. So those would be the three for me. And I think at 45, I could still ride the horse and carry the shield and um, do the karate. <laughs> um, right on. Let's do one more question before we go to our intros. Hanchi Legacy, I know you had one about the attributes of a fighter. Do you want to throw that one at us? Uh, a lot of people, probably uh, people that are, are watching, uh, some may wonder, like, what are the things I should concentrate on if I want to be a good fighter? So I sort of put that out there. What are the attributes? What do you, each one of us think? 
or something that you absolutely need to do so that these people will go out and start training that in depth in order to be a good fighter. You can't just go somewhere and somebody shows you a self-defense and go out in the street and think you can apply it. There's a lot of groundwork and a lot of years, and I'm talking minimum 10, minimum 10 12 years for street fighting and defending your life. In a ring, it's different. You can train for a couple of years, become a good fighter, learn the best techniques. So basically, that's it. Let's say, is that, are you, are we talking about the Olympic thing? Is that no, the no. topic? No, that's more for the kata. Okay. Yeah, this is about being a good fighter. A good fighter. Uh, say like Jean-Yves Terrio or like uh, some common guy who's trained in martial arts. He finds himself in the street and three people wanting his underwear. <laughs> I don't know. Who do you decide who do you decide to give the underwear to? That's the oh, I see. Okay, let's start with somebody different. How about Benson? Because he he always waits for us. I appreciate that, Hanchi. Um, I wrote down four things right as you were talking there. Um, one is fortitude. You know, to to essentially, this is both mental and physically, but basically to train in a way that you keep coming back whether you want to or not. So the fortitude isn't necessarily about getting hit or getting hurt. It's about keep coming back, whether you want to or not, because you don't want to have that fight, but whether you want to or not, if that happens on the street, you're dealing with it. So that just has to do with consistency. Um, a good mind, you know, you always say you'll take the intelligent fighter, somebody who can understand concepts, you know, somebody who can understand what critical distance is or, um, and then the, the good mind leads to technique somebody can funnel that fortitude and consistency in their mind into generating power. You're not going to do, I, I think it was, uh, was it Leo Laux who said, if you hit someone with your best technique and they don't go down, you better get practicing. So, you know, you have to be able to channel that fortitude of consistency, that good mind and be able to learn therefore how to hit something and hurt it. And then the last thing, and this is what you always say, Hanchi, I'm not going to use your words because you know what they are willingness to get hurt. You can't be a fighter if you don't have a willingness. It's not even you're okay with it. It's that you're willing to. So those That's are my four. Uh, Sensei Sweeno? Uh, I'm not super different. Uh, the first quality I wrote down was grit. Uh, just in general, somebody who who is tough, right? I don't think you can be... Um, you can't... I, I, think, I don't think you can lack grit in your daily life and be a good fighter. Right. You if you're going to be a good ring fighter, you have to have the grit when you train. But I just think somebody who wakes up and is able, able to grind um, in daily life, they're going to be a better, better grinder in fighting. Uh, somebody who's got awareness, spatial awareness, environmental awareness, awareness of other people's moods. Uh, that really helps. Um, Sean said the willingness to to in, encounter pain. I just I wrote the ability to work through pain. We talked about this on a show a couple of weeks ago. Right. Um, a quality of a fighter is somebody who can take a licking and keep on keep on ticking. Um, and then I don't know if this is uh, controversial, but I think to be a good fighter, you have to take a little joy in inflicting pain on others or at least lack the reluctance to do it. Right. Because that stops a lot of people. Um, and I think something in common with most really good street fighters and and uh, and good uh uh, you know, tournament fighters that I know is that they just have a little bit of that, that in the minute, maybe they're really nice people when they're not in the ring <laughs> um, or when they're not fighting, but uh, they take just a little bit of pleasure in inflicting pain or dominating <laughs> others. And Hey, you know, pe they're people of all stripes. That's a stripe that helps you as a fighter. You're up. Right. I like that. The grit, toughness, fortitude. I think those are all similar things. And one of the things I think about that is uh, a good fighter has that more innately. They were born with it or as a child, it was like beat into them or they had to hustle. If you showed up at 20 and came to a dojo and you didn't have grit or fortitude or toughness, you're only going to make so much progress, I think, <laughs> like personally.
that's just my opinion. Um, but I would say I'll go a little bit on the more just for people who are watching and listening. I think, you know, you got to be physically fit to be a good fighter, a street fighter, whatever it is. Like, I think you got to be physically fit. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to train. You're not going to be able to get in a dojo mm -hmm. and actually do the work that you have to do to actually learn the stuff that you got to learn to be able to become a good fighter. So, you know, and I know that kind of happens hand in hand. You're learning the techniques and you're getting physically fit. But at some point, you got to be in good shape, right? And if I'm not saying people who aren't in good shape can't be tough, but it's easier if you're in good shape, right? Like that's it's easier if you're in good shape. Uh, then I would say you have to have good technique. Um, yeah, it's good to be tough, but uh, you're going to get knocked on your ass by somebody who can just throw one good straight right hand that's twice as weak as you. And they actually have a good, a good couple of techniques that they can consistently hit you with, with a high percentage. So I would say for me, that's physically fit. Then you got to have some good technique. Um, and then I would say if we're talking about even on the street or wherever you have to have a teacher who can give you some strategy. Right. And then you have to be willing to get in there and employ that strategy and fail at it um, and be bad at it until you get good at it. And you get so good at it that nobody uh, can overcome that. So, and then the last two things, well, three things I would say is find a good teacher and be a good student, right? You got to find a good teacher and then you got to fucking listen to that person. Like, do you know how many times I said the sense of legacy? It's not working. I tried to do what you said and I'm getting my ass kicked. And he said, keep doing it. Try it again. One more week. Go one more week. One more week. And then eventually I went, holy shit, sensei, it worked. And he's <laughs> like, watch how easy it's going to be every day after this now, right? Um, but my last thing I would say is for you to be a good fighter, you want to be a good street fighter, you, you better be willing to be uncomfortable. If you mm -hmm. think you're going to do that in your cozy pajamas, you're going to have to stand in front of killers and tough people, and you're going to feel uncomfortable. And if you can't jump into feeling uncomfortable... I don't think it's really going to happen. Not over the long haul. Anyway, you might be a flash in the pan, but you're not going to be consistently tough and a good fighter over a long haul. So that's my answer. Sensei. What's your answer? Sensei. Uh, well, I, <clears throat> first thing I wrote down because I was being more to the point, learn how to block. Blocking will allow you to apply what you know. Uh, you know, the old saying goes, if nobody scores on you, you'll never lose the game. It's the same thing with fighting. You, in order, you have to be inside to create, to cause damage to the other person. So you're blocking, letting them cross the distance, blocking and hit them. Yeah. And when you're going in, at some point, you're going to have to look for what's coming at you while you're going in and you have to block to get in. So if I was going to take one physical thing, it would be learn your blocking. Get your friend to stand in the dojo and throw whatever he has at you. And you don't even tell him, but for the entire fight, just block. You'll be saying, hey, I'm doing pretty good. And he's got you in a corner, just trying to hammer the crap out of you and just try to block. And once you can do that, you can block yourself into the position that you want to be in. And my second thing that I would add, and this may surprise some of you, is kata. Kata allows you to discover your own weaknesses. And that way you can learn how to cover them up and, and uh, mentally prepare yourself for what Randy said. It's like a police officer every day. I've said this like three times already, but I'm going to say it again. It's like a police officer whose life is put on the line every day. A guy pulls a gun out and points it at a young person. You have to pull your gun out and shoot them. Like, how hard is that going to be for, as a human being? In Kata, I've, I've said this also many times. How many times have I killed in martial arts? A lot. A lot. Because during my kata, you set your mind that if I had to do this on somebody in the neck, is 
my friend from Chatham says all the time. Um, you have to be, you have to temper your mind that if this happens, you will be cold and you'll deliver those techniques and do what has to be done to protect your own life. Only protect your own life. And your techniques and everything else is also included in that kata. That's why kata is body, mind, and spirit. It's where you start. It's where you set your bases for being a good kata. So those are my answers. Hey, Sensei, the one thing I want to, your defense thing, the be, be good at your blocking defense. I have... I remember once we were uh, we were in the dojo, and it was like you, me, Tara Lee. I think Mike Russell was there. I think you were there, Benson too. We were just having one of those days. I think it was uh, at this time of year, Christmas break. And uh, I remember I was fighting with Tara Lee, and when it was all said and done, I turned and I think I was fighting with Mike Russell or somebody, and she said to you. I can't, I just can't get at him. Like he just imposes his will on me. And I, and you said, that's because Randy has good defense. He can impose his will on you because he can block all your stuff and move to the inside. And that's why he can impose his will on you. And I've always thought about that. Like that your defense is the thing that allows you to like, actually like give it to somebody more mm -hmm. than, than just being able to have a good punch, right? A good punch is important, but if you can never set it up, it's never going to land. That's right, yeah. It's just like if you, you're trying on the opposite side exactly what you're saying. If you're the aggressor and you can't hit the guy, eventually you will lose. Yes. The With the it. exception of you, Sense of Legacy, I can, I'm looking, not Sense of Maletsky and people I don't know, but a lot of the people on the call have probably come after me on this call only to find that I was... I pushed a couple of things aside and I was standing in a different position, just looking at them without having done anything. And I know you've done that to me. There's so many times I was like, I've got them. I've got them. And, I, and then the next thing I knew you weren't where I thought. And I was like looking some other place and you're like, just tap me on the head or something like, yeah. Um, it's so funny that we're talking about this because Mike Russell, who's on this call yesterday, we were having a long chat about this. We were literally talking about it. And I just want to apply it to grappling because the basic idea in grappling is defend, escape, position, submission. And what you said that's so key to that, Hanchi, you didn't just say block. You said block your way into position because there's defending. But when you sweep in jujitsu, usually you end up in the better position. So if I'm sweeping from bottom half guard, I'm now in top half guard. So now you're blocking or escaping in jits into position from which you can then inflict the damage. And it's just so funny that we're having this conversation because Mike and I were literally talking about this very thing. And it, the, the principles are actually very parallel. If you're just defending, you're going to end up losing. But if you defend your way into position, then you're actually in a position to inflict something. And uh, that's the escape versus defense in, in, in grappling. And I, I really like that we're talking about this and just reinforcing that. How it just applies. It just happens to be on the ground. Um, I just want to comment on two things before we do our intros, if you all don't mind. Sensei Suino, you said something about not just willingness to get hurt, but willingness to inflict pain and maybe a joy with it. I've mentioned The Smashing Machine. It's a documentary. You can literally watch it on YouTube about Mark Kerr. And early on, he talks about this, how when someone hurts you, are you going to take it? Are you going to try and win? Or are you going to actually want to go back and punish them for the sheer act of trying to have hurt you? And it cuts to a shot of him in a Brazil fight pre-UFC where a guy's eyes split and he's literally peeling the skin up back when you could do that. And you're like, he, he ended up being a UFC champion. You're like, that's a guy who whether he enjoyed it or not, he had a willingness to go, oh, you're trying to do this to me? Wait till you see what I do back. Uh, and then Sensei, one thing I wanted to mention, you said the grit of the toughness, you know, the idea you can't teach heart. And one thing you've said in class many times, and I share with my students mm -hmm. is, you say, I can't want this more than you do. You know, 
you, you can't teach somebody to want something more than you do. They got to go get that themselves or come with it. Yeah. And sometimes we describe that as being competitive, right? Like that might be a, uh, that might be a big word to encompass a lot of this stuff, right? The, the, the willingness to take pain and get back to try to dominate, um, to try to give people back pain, the, the same, the same pain that they gave you, right. Wanting it more than others. I don't think competitiveness gives you the full spectrum of the, of the feeling, but uh, right. You, you want to, you have to want to win. And another word since you know might be sadistic, right? Like, yeah. And I, I mean that truly, right? Like when I say things in here about you got to be willing to like punch somebody in the head and shatter their jaw and all their teeth come out of their head and blah, blah, blah. And then I always say, but not somebody weaker or less. Like everybody gets like tense about that until I say, well, what if Saddam Hussein was standing in front of you? Would you do it to him? That's what you're training for, right? You're training for that, like Hitler, Saddam Hussein, like other nefarious, terrible people where you can go to sleep at night and feel good about the service you just provided to the earth. And I guess it's a bit sadistic to say, well, you're training maybe for that to happen, right? Um, or that's yeah, an well, element. That's an know, element. Yeah, you know, there's that there's that meme going around, right, where people say, um, um, you know, somebody who's incapable of violence can't truly be peaceful. I don't know if I accept that, but the, the notion is you're not truly peaceful unless you have the ability to do violence and you choose not to. And I think the 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 quality of the elevated warrior is that they can occupy both spaces, is that they choose to be gentle. They can be kind and tender and re tender in regular life, but they have this, this switch, right, that they can turn on. And I think that's better than having the sad sadistic attitude all the time. First of all, it's exhausting. Second of all, you're not a good member of society. But if you can flip flop, then you have the, the sadistic nature, if that's what you want to call it, when you need it. Also, Tori Hanchi. Yeah, I was going to say there's there's a lady, Rochelle Bislip, who's on this call. She's got to be the toughest woman I, I ever met. At first, she never had the skills, but you know, she'd come in and she'd just walk in swinging in. She got hit in the face and in the body so many times, but she just never quit. She 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 works on a farm like she's a tough person, and that allowed her to be able to uh, last week receive or last Sunday receive a black belt from us. It was her toughness, it was her willingness to overcome. I'm just saying that because it happened before our very eyes. All of us. Who are sitting here since this we know was at our Christmas dinner and we we gave uh, the black belt so she was one of the recipients. She took more time than others, but it was well deserved. Thanks, Anchi. Yeah, we were there for that. It was excellent. And the other thing I just wanted to go back to is the idea of like the willingness to inflict pain. I think you know we're talking about whether it's sadistic or not. I actually think it's a willingness to win and the reason i think that and i'd love to know what anyone thinks we can go around the horn or maybe one of you can just chip in but a lot of people who come to the martial arts have had a rough go and sometimes i think toughness but losing is almost a way to numb yourself to another shitty environment you grew up in right like it feels better than the other feeling in my wound itself but the willingness to win means that you're not just receiving but also giving so you have to flip it to a positive, not just an endurance of shit. Because a lot of people who come through the martial arts through difficult things, myself included, by the way, not physical. Um, the endurance is good, but you don't want the endurance to be just taking headshots. So at a certain point, you got to be able to start giving them. What about this? Do you think you have to believe that you deserve to win? Isn't that why some people train harder? Because if they train hard enough, they think that they've outworked the other person and deserve to win. Or do you just value yourself as a person that, more than the other person? And you just is 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 that a, is that a way of thinking about it? I think that's yeah. a way. Yeah, well, I was just going to for myself, Census Fino. <clears throat> um, when I competed initially, I wanted to like, and I wanted to do good, but a driving force for me would have been Sense of Legacy. Right. I wanted to see, I, I wanted him to see me doing good. Right. Like I wanted to prove myself to these people that in my eyes, 
they were tough, they were capable, they were skilled. And that for me, I'm just saying that was one of my like really driving forces was be able to prove myself to those people um, that I was looking up to, to be able to stand with them. If we're talking about the ring, about competition, you deserve to be in the ring. You don't deserve to win. Your skills will, and the other person's skills will decide that. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you learn, if you train yourself in martial arts, prepare yourself to defend someone else or your family or yourself of harm, you deserve to win that. That's just my opinion. One thing, Sensei, and, you know, there's there's a real rabbit hole here, and I don't think we need to go down it, but I do think that people can subconsciously not feel like they deserve to win, and that can undermine even a moment, you know, in a moment. Like, there's a great story of two Ironman triathletes, and they were step by step, and right, like literally 100 miles of biking, 26-mile marathon after a 2.6-mile swim, and with 100 meters to go, the one guy said to the other, Hey, no matter what, you can be proud of yourself. And the other guy just backed off. That guy gave him permission to lose. And for whatever reason, the other guy took it. And I think there's a little something subconscious in there where somebody, you know, I, I pulled up this quote from De Niro and he, you don't see me doing thrill seeker liquor store holdups with a born to lose tattoo on my chest, which is his way of saying, I'm not a dime store criminal who's looking to go back to jail. He says that to Pacino. And I think there's a point where some people subconsciously are. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying about you can't just be trying to fix a wound by losing more with a different version of pain. But because you're tough, you get through it. There is a version where you have to see yourself not as the winner, but possibly the winner. And at that point, but if you can never see that, I don't think you ever will be. I think in that moment, you'll let the other guy congratulate you and win. So there's two parts to this idea. One is whether you truly deserve to win. That's objective, right? How hard did you train? What talent did you have? What teachers did you have? That's what Hanchi addressed, right? So you mm -hmm. deserve to be in the ring, but you don't deserve to win unless you put in the work. Um, but the other part is the attitude, right? Um, and what you just said, Sean, is there's some people that come in that that don't believe that, mm -hmm. right? That's a classic story between Arnold and um, who was the guy that played Hulk in the movies? Lou. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Lou Ferrig, uh, right? He would no. just come in and say, oh, sorry, man. Looks like you peaked three days ago, right? And he would just take the air out of his balloon. <laughs> and uh, uh, and and Arnold believed that he was that he was going to win or that he deserved to win. And Lou did not, right? And um, I don't know where it came from for me, but right, you know, when I was a kid, you know, going to judo battles or academic battles, I always deserve, I believed I deserved to win probably just arrogance, irrational arrogance. Um, but I know a lot of people that don't think that. And they sab a lot of times, if you don't, you sabotage yourself, right? Which I think it was your point, Sean. Well, I mean, look, I had a real successful high school in terms of the things I did. I won awards. I won academic awards, sports awards. At camp, I won sailing awards. So I actually inherently had a sense that I'm a winner. And actually, that's where the humility of karate was, okay, I don't not see myself as a winner. I'm just not real good at this yet. Like, and that was a beautiful thing because that meant, okay, my psyche lets me know the trophy can be mine, but my skill level and my time in isn't there yet. So for me, whatever it's worth, I think that was relatively healthy because it's like, you can be. The only difference is the work, man. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a psychological barrier to it. There was just, I don't know how to do it yet. Mm -hmm. And that's cool because it should be a skill not a gift. If it's a gift, then you got to wait for someone to give it to you. But if it's a skill, you can train it. I, I just don't want to conflate things here, right, Sean? Sorry, like sailing is different than combat. Um, there's a difference there. If you don't think you can win, you're going in knowing you're going to get your ass beat. Like you're going to get a black eye and a chipped tooth and a broken finger or broken ribs. Um, I had this conversation in Sensuino's Dojo once with somebody who tried to equate EI to, to golf. And, and I said, well, the consequences are a little bit different when you duff the ball in golf and when you fuck up your draw um, that's designed to cut somebody's arms off before they cut your head off. 
Um, and so deserving like these things, I think that's the whole nature and nurture thing, right? I think that's what we're getting at, right? It, is it in your nature? Did you pick the right parents? And then what environment did you grow up in? You know, I know, Sean, you grew up in an affluent environment where you were expected. It just was expected of you that you were going to get 90s and you were going to win awards. And I don't know what pressure that put on you, but I know that that's... And for me, I grew up around people <clears throat> who were physically aggressive and pushed me around and shoved me around. And at a certain point, it wasn't about winning or losing. It was just about... One day I was like, you're not going to fucking push me again. Mm -hmm. right? Like, that's it. Like, it's done now. Right. And since like, you all know, like a person, exactly. one of my uncles went, go ahead, punch me right there. He never touched me again after I punched him. Not one time after that. <laughs> and that was in my mind, that was like, okay, you're not hitting me anymore. You're not shoving me around anymore. I'm standing up for myself. And then when I get in the ring, I'm standing up for myself. And when I step out on the dojo floor, I'm standing up for myself. So yeah. nature and nurture. And my parents were tough. My dad was tough. My mom was tough. Like his uncles were tough. <laughs> and my teachers are tough. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna do our intros. <laughs> and then if you senseis don't mind, a topic fell out of this that we've never discussed, but it's mentioned almost every show. So I'll, I'll jump to that after. But I always have the pleasure when we do this of introducing Sensei Nicolas Suino. He is an eighth in in Iaido, a sixth in in Jiu Jitsu and Judo. Um, but one thing I just wanna say about Sensei Suino, and, and this is really gonna be my introduction. I've seen him twice in the last um, month. and I think we've one-on-one -on -one chatted for at least two and a half hours in that time. And I think we've touched on specifics and training and we've touched on, um, I, I don't want to like sound faux deep, but we've just laterally gone into about 37 topics that are philosophical, practical. And, you know, Hanchi Legacy always says he, he enjoys an intelligent martial artist and intelligence isn't book smart. I think it's the ability to relate verbally and ideologically to another person. And all my three senseis on this call have that. And I just want to say with Sensei Suino, it's been such a pleasure um, to just keep deepening this ongoing conversation we're having. And um, I hope everyone's instructors um, and everybody's students get the same benefit of that type of back and forth, whatever it looks like for them. Sensei Suino, how are you doing tonight? Doing great, man. Thank you so much. I have really enjoyed our conversations uh, and that we've kind of fa fallen into them. You've given me some really great advice and I hope I've given you some things to think about. Um, it's been it's been wonderful and I hope it doesn't it's not too long before we can get in the same room and and do that again. Um, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. The last few months, the last year has been wonderful. We've trained all of us have been together so much. We've done so many martial arts in so many different places. Uh, what a life we lead. <laughs> and and I can't wait to see where it goes. Am I supposed to introduce somebody? <laughs> Generally, you do Sensei Dauphin when we when we were doing this back in the day. That guy. Um, yeah, man. Uh, what can I say? I've been thinking a lot about uh, the fighting that he and I do, and what I mean by that is we train together in Iaido. Um, we often train in karate together, and he honors me by by uh, not knocking my block off in karate. Uh, which is really cool, but I always learn something by watching him, by listening to him, uh, by watching him train with others and by getting in there and sparring with him and taking my losses. It's really educational. And then I like to think it's a little bit flipped when we go to the ground. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think it's kind of the same situation. I'm sure he learns from listening to me and, um, and feeling the techniques. Uh, it's super fun. I know we can both go really hard at both of those things. And at the same time, have absolute trust that there's no ill intent, uh, despite the fact that both he and I are people who enjoy taking, inflicting a little pain on others sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, awesome guy. Uh, uh, he's done so much in the last few years to move forward, Legacy Sean Rue, to move forward, J Mac, um, uh, to move forward all of our enterprises. And I just can't say enough good things about him. Thank you, Sensei. That's uh, really nice. And Sensei Legacy, maybe if you just chat, you'll pop up. Like if you clear your voice or something, your image might pop up on the screen. 
I can see nope. Hachi. I've got him too. Yeah, I got him yep. too. You can't see. I guess it's not that important. I wouldn't mind uh, not being able to see myself. <laughs> I'm having a problem. Well, you're anyway, looking great, Hachi. Just keep talking. Yes, I'm going to introduce Sensu Legacy, even though he can't see himself. I don't want to say, uh, says, you know, thanks. And there's no doubt about it that on the ground, yeah, you're like, you teach me like so many lessons. And um, when I first started doing grappling like 18 months ago, uh, I would go to Sensu and I'd be like, I can't get this arm bar. I can't get that. And I'd be saying shit. And he'd say, Randy, I think you should stop. You're a person who tries to win all the time and you should stop trying to win and you should just, you know, go for position. Don't use as much muscle. And uh, as soon as he said that to me, I right away, every time I went to the, the gym, I would be like, you're a white belt. Just go in there. Just be a white belt. Like, and it's hard to get your mindset out of that sometimes when you've done other things for a long time. So that's a really valuable lesson he taught me. Um, in the last little bit, last year or two, in addition to like the 100,000 other lessons he's taught me. Um, I get to introduce Sensei Legacy, who's a 10th then, and Legacy Shoranru and Matsumura White Crane. And also, he's also a Shodan and Yaido under Sensei Suino. And uh, the thing I want to share with everybody is I was sitting next to him at the Christmas party um, on Sunday with 150 people uh uh james freeze was there from heritage uh adet rice was there from driftwood since Sweeno was there with a bunch of people from j mac and there were all these people and i leaned over to him and i said hey in 1971 when you walked in the door uh to do karate did you ever think that 52 years later all this shit was going to be happening <laughs> right and uh he said no but uh but the reality is that's what happened, right? And we talk about this all the time. So that grit, that tenacity in 1971, since he walked into a dojo and just kept walking into the dojo and just kept walking into the dojo and kept teaching whoever was in front of him and kept getting the lessons. And as a result, there's an abundance of humans now that their lives have been changed forever because of that. Their lives will never be, and they might not even be here today, but their lives have still been changed and they're different forever. And uh, I'm really grateful. I, I love Sense of Legacy with all of my heart. I'm really proud to have been able to watch all this for the time I've been here. And uh, yeah, Sense of Legacy, can you see yourself on the screen yet? No, don't care either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <clears throat> well, can you see us? No. No one. Okay. Green huh. just went blank back to the opening page. It's okay. As long as you can see it, it's okay. The show's okay. not interfered with. Okay. Uh, so what do you want to say about any of that stuff for any of us, Sensei? Oh, I was I'm sorry, I was working on trying to get that back. I no lost problem. pace, so you you go ahead, I'll kick in soon. No problem. Um so I got this question I'd love to ask. And every single episode, if not only one missing, the concept comes up of find a great teacher. And we've done episodes on what we believe great teaching is, but I'm not sure we've ever truly touched on, and I think this is for the listener as much as any of us, how does someone find a great teacher? Like we could all watch somebody for five minutes and get a sense of whether we'd recommend someone to that school or not. But when somebody has no concept of martial arts, all they're doing is watching UFC. They walk into a flashy club with music blaring, people fighting really hard, and then they may be watching a classical dojo that doesn't look like that. How is that person going to know where to go? What would you? Let's start with you, Sensei Suino. How would somebody who doesn't know the world that they're walking into know if they're walking into a good teacher's world or not? I have some ideas on this. I know this is one hunch is going to have like one sentence that destroys the rest of our answers, but I'm going to, I'm going to go anyway. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's hard for people that don't know, right. They get sucked in by the wrong stuff. They see the flashy stuff. Um, they see, you know, a lot of people see a teacher yelling and screaming or humiliating, uh, right. Humiliating the students or, or shouting really loud. You know, none of those things are the, are the truth. If I were to say 
if I were to give somebody some advice, they have never done martial arts and they I can't hold their hand when they go in, I would say, evaluate it with patience, do it over time, watch a few classes, think about it, maybe talk to some students. Um, you know, obviously these days you can read things online, read reviews and all that stuff, but you just have to gather as much information as you can. Because I suspect if you're new new at this, you're going to be looking at the wrong the, the wrong things, right? I mean, credentials are important. Uh, the atmosphere in the dojo is important, right? The the attitude of the students is important. Uh, so yeah, I think that's what I would say to somebody. Right on, thanks, Sensei Suino. Sensei Dofan, what would you say to somebody who has no idea their internet's telling them every school's four point two stars? How do they pick? Uh, well, a couple of things for me, I think, uh, since Lacey taught me this a long time ago, he said, cause I saw him say to people, don't talk to me, go talk to my students, ask them what type of an instructor I am, ask them. And he didn't stand there while they were <laughs> giving their, right? like he didn't stand there looking at them. <laughs> so one thing like, you know, recently when I went to Cambridge BJJ, uh, I went in with that. You recommended that place, Sean. So that was good. I had a good recommendation. So, you know, ask, ask in your community, like, you know, who are some good instructors? Where should I go? And maybe don't just go to one, go to a couple and check it out if you got some recommendations. And then when I went there, I was like, what are the people like here? What, like, you know, when it got hands on, I found that the community there was really nice, very helpful. They fought really hard, they trained really hard but it was safe. And when you got in the change room, people were saying, Hey, how are you? Who are you? I haven't seen you before. And when you left, they were like, Hey, good job today, man. Like, it's nice to see you here. I hope you come back next week. Right. Uh, second thing I would say is um, when you walk in the door, if they start giving you the financial contract and asking you to sign things, you should turn on your heels and get the hell out of there as soon as you can. Right. I think going to a place where they want you to love what they're doing um, first, and then ask you to contribute to it uh, financially, spiritually, mentally, like, I think that's a really important thing that they should be trying to introduce you to it and at least give you a flavor of what it is mm -hmm. before they put you on the black belt contract. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, again, like, the last thing I would say is you actually can physically look at the teacher and talk to the teacher. And if they physically look like they've never done what they're going to try and teach you to do, mm -hmm. you should probably get out of there. And, you know, if they haven't brushed their teeth and their uniform isn't clean and their hair is not brushed um, and their uniform smells like cat piss, then these are all red flags for me. You should, and you look around the school and there's no pride of ownership. It's not clean. It's dirty. The mirrors are gross. These are like, get out of there. Right. <laughs> so I don't know. It, a lot of that sounds simplistic, but that I for me, it's great. What about you, Hanchi Legacy? What advice would you give to someone on how to pick that good teacher? Well, first, I'll just get a couple of small things out of the way. <clears throat> Make sure that they're not called Zendor the Great and they're 20. <laughs> And they're 20 years old and they have like 20 or 30 stripes on. You know, look at the person. If 35 years to be a master, a grandmaster, 35 years. So you can guess if a guy has a fifth hand, he should be somewhere in the middle aged. You know, you see some young guy, like there was this Taekwondo undisputed champion guy on uh, Facebook or somewhere the other day. And a lot of people made uh, comments on that. Look at the person's certificate. Look on the wall for a certificate and check it out. Um, look for the the dojo's ads, at least to say traditional or classical, right? And then finally, uh, what I believe Sensei Dauphin touched on was don't go in and look at the sensei. He may be great. I know some guys that are great martial artists, but they couldn't teach you how to do up your shoelaces. So look at the students, see what they look like to you. And I remember first time I went in, I looked at the students. First person I saw was 
John Pearson. He looked really good to me. He he still trains with us today, and I was like 52 years ago. So there is a lot of different things, but those are all the hints from everyone. Do your what you want to do, especially if you're you're putting your children into on uh, into somebody's hands. Make sure you do your. Don't just make it a local guy. Oh, this guy's closest will bring you there. Don't do that. Check out the person. Make sure, you know, that they're legitimate. Thanks, Hanchi. I have nothing what to about ask. You, yeah. What about you, Francis? You picked a dojo based on a picture on a wall. So what would you say to people now? <laughs> well, it's funny because I, I sort of did because I went and talked to the Taekwondo people and they talked about how flexible and fit I would get. And I just come off of 10 years of ballet. I was already flexible and fit, but I didn't mind it. And then I talked to Aikido and they said, what a great group it is. You're going to grow community. And we it's a real good group. And I was like, great. But I had a lot of friends. And then I remember seeing Al Menesis and I did fall in love with that photo that I've shown so many times. Um, but I said, am I going to like make a lot of friends and, and get flexible and fit? And he goes, well, I guess, but you're going to learn karate. And when he said that, I was in. This was the photo I've referred to so many times. This literal photo was sitting there and I didn't know what it was, but I just, I wanted it. Um, and so in any case, um, yeah, I, everything that's been said, ha, <laughs> everything that's been said, I agree with. You know, I knew I wanted to join when I saw Hanchi, but a couple of weeks later, I was smart enough to go, right, but he didn't teach himself. So I looked at the black belts and when I watched them, I said, oh God, yeah, I'm in. Um, it was a great group. The only thing I'll add is that any teacher who tells you you're not good at something, but then doesn't give you a specific workable way to get better at it, run, don't walk away from them. If someone goes, your kicks suck and walks away. Yeah, that's why I'm here. If they don't say drive the knee or this or that, we see this in the acting community a lot. And I think it's in the martial arts too. Being told you're bad at something is egoic for the teacher. And it is true. So your ego actually flares. You feel seen, even if it's a negative. And the ego doesn't know the difference between negative and positive. If it's not a technical thing, you can go practice. Then run, don't walk away from that teacher. Um, Sensei Suino, I know you have a question about uh, about weapons. I have a lot of questions, but this is the one I want to <laughs> ask tonight. Um, if you... Pick, had to pick a weapon to learn and get really, really good at and maybe eventually fight with, what would it be? And it can't be a weapon you're already capable with. So nobody in here can pick the katana. Um, and I've seen some of you guys with comma and 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 uh, size and things like that. I think that's probably off limits. So it's a new weapon maybe that you haven't done before. Um, you pick the scenario on that. Like, and what's what do you mean? And in the dojo or in self-defense or um well so i'm gonna let's go back to our era question so um let's let's go back to a to a battle era of japan so you're gonna you're gonna go out and you have to fight japanese train japanese warriors or train mongolian warriors what's your so this is not a weapon for um dilettante purposes it's not just something you're going to learn and then hang on the shelf when you're not training it this is a weapon you're going to learn to have to use in battle against other human beings hunchy you got one hunchy you got one oh yeah i would i would pick the stick because you can find it anywhere mm -hmm. it's accessible on the ground or you can tear one out of a tree or you're not usually walking around well back in those days maybe that you are but if i had a choice i would take the tombow or the bow because the bow could keep the opponent at a distance. Mm -hmm. uh, even the only guy to ever touch Miyamoto Musashi was Genosuke with a six Oroku Shaku bow, mm -hmm. a six foot length stick. And he was a formidable opponent. But um, Musashi came back and, and destroyed him and, and held his sword to his neck and said, Because you once defeated me, uh, I will let you live. And they just, <laughs> you never heard of that guy. Again. Love it. Yeah, you could follow him by the smell of his trail. But... <laughs> right? But Sensei, you're good with a bow and you're good with a tombow. So think of a weapon that you didn't use before mm -hmm. that you're not good with, that you would want to be good with. 
right? Because otherwise I'm going to say the katana. Then I'm not allowed to say that. He already, <laughs> he already said table. I'm not allowed to say that. So. I would say probably the noon checker because hmm. it is also a simple weapon. I like you that could, one. Yeah, you could people keep people at a distance and you can make them lose their weapon by hitting the back of their hands with it. It moves very quickly. It can use, you know, they're not just be twirled around. You can choke somebody out and you can uh, break somebody's wrist with it. You can break their arm. It has a lot of different uses than just you swinging it. You can trap and grapple and poke with it. So that's what I would, I would do. The nunchaku. I like it. I like it. Randy, what do you got? Uh, I, I'd have to pick a bow and arrow. Q, like not necessarily kudo per se, right? But I just like, I like the bow. I like, because I are, already have the other weapons. So if I'm going to learn another one in that era, I'd want one that's a long range weapon, right? They they fought with them, like indigenous people fought with them. Even when they ran out of arrows, they still use them as a weapon, like in their hands. Um, they're silent. I like the fact that they're quiet. Right. There's no tell people do it off of horseback. They do it out of a tree. They do it on the ground. They do it in a boat like they just. Um, and also they serve other purposes other than just in warfare. Right. So you can you could shoot an elk and then eat something when you're on the battlefield, like and you're there for days and days. You can use that weapon to go hunt something and stay alive. Right. So I think for me, it would be it would be archery. That would be the thing that I. I would want to know today if I could be in the matrix and they could just go, I go, I know I'm an archer, right? Like that's, that's what I would want. <laughs> and you know, it's a deep, uh, it's a deep pursuit, right? You know, I grew up with a recurve and then uh, when I started hunting as in my twenties, I used a compound bow. And then for the last 10 years, I've had a crossbow and every one of those puts a smile on your face when you get good at it because the stuff you can do with bow and arrow is just amazing, right? Yeah. yeah. Super cool. Sean, weapon that you don't already you have any skills in, what would it be? Okay, he can't I'm say good. archery. He can't say archery because he's already got <laughs> it. Well, that's yeah. the funny thing. When you first mentioned it, look, there's capable and there's good. Mm -hmm. So I'm capable. And this was before you mentioned classical warring. And I was like, hands down, give me a gun off the hip. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that Terran tactical level of precision where you just, you know, John wicking things. But then we went earlier. My immediate answer then was bow and arrow because I'm problem with bow and arrows. I'm pretty good. Like I can recurve a bullseye at 25 yards nicely. So I, I go full on Naginata. Mm. I want that long spear. I just feel like in battle that that's a highly effective weapon and then can obviously be used as a bow itself. Um, I'm stealing that from the show Blue Eyed Samurai. Um, there's, a, If you've seen that, I highly recommend it for everybody watching. I'm not invested in, in any way. I just think it's one of the best things I've seen in a long time. And they talk about the different weapons at different ranges. And I just think that's a real good, you're on the battlefield. You got a nice long spear. Hook me up. Yeah. You know, you said to Sino, are you going to pick? You have so many refined. <laughs> I want to see, see you with a mace. I want to see. You. <laughs> I would like a mace, to be honest with you. Um, um, you know, my first thought when I asked the question was a Mongolian bow, a short bow, right? Because they were short and strong, and you know, you could shoot them on horseback. But um, my second choice would be a yari, right? Which is the same as a naginata, but the naginata has a curved blade and the yari has a straight blade. And I've always had a fascination with them. I think it's really cool the way those blade, those points are shaped. Um, and I visited a temple where they had the remains, like half or a, a third of a naginata that uh, this giant samurai used to have, and it had burned a little bit and it, they had it on their, in the front of their temple. And I was just, I don't know, it had this energy to it. Uh, you know, a lot of magical things happen in temples in Japan, as you know, Randy. Um, but yeah. when I went to see that, it was just, I, I was just blown away by the authenticity of it and just the 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 material thickness and heaviness of this yari that I saw there. So I've always had a little bit of a desire to maybe get into that world someday when I run out of hobbies. All right, then I want to change my answer and say 
that I want to I want to strap my katana onto the end of a bow because I know how to use a bow and a katana <laughs> if they're together. That's a different weapon, right? So, <laughs> um, okay, we have um, two finisher questions, but we're not there yet because we have a question that came in from Dreedy. So if we can throw Dreedy's camera on, bring her on board. This is a great question, by the way. Um, so I look forward to this, Dreedy. How hey, are Dreedy. you? I'm good. How are you? How's everybody Since doing? Legacy, what do you want to say about Dreedy's grading? She just graded through a purple belt. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I said to her when she did. <laughs> um, wow. I I wish all the students took the time and trained so they would look like you. You are a great representative of our style. I just love it. Thank you, Hanshi. That means a lot. Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> um, it's time for my question. Okay. Um, yeah. So seeing as that it's the almost the end of the year and uh, the last host chat of the year, I'm wondering what are some of your top highlights of 2023, martial arts related or otherwise? Love to hear it. Um, and maybe let's start with Sensei Smino. That's the end of the show, right there. <laughs> <laughs> Highlights of 2023. Oh my gosh. This has been such a busy martial arts year, and it's just been amazing. Holy smokes, I can't even remember everything. Um, uh, here's how they occurred to me. So I visited the Matsumura Challenge. That was cool. I walk into a gym. The event is already well underway when i walk in there's so many people in there i can't even see the floor where the stuff is happening it was just packed so i start wandering around and thinking gosh it's going to be hard to see and then i i had this moment of enlightenment i go wait a minute i'm a big shot around here screw this <laughs> so i walked to the other side of the gym where all the black belts and red and white belts were and i said oh i'm where i want to be um, and I just got to see a whole bunch of people fight and do kata and hang out with all these people I like. Matsumura Challenge was amazing. Um, uh, Randy and I had a an Eido camp um, mm -hmm. and back in the spring, and it was really well attended. We did like a whole weekend of Eido. We had people come from all over, and um, I think it was the biggest one we've done. And uh, and I had a bunch of the top J Mackers. In fact, we had the five rings there which I affectionately call myself Holland Sensei, Miller Sensei, Spangler Sensei, and Sensei Dauphin. Um, it's just kind of like the apex group of my uh, EIDL. Uh, I don't want to take up the whole time, uh, but I will do a couple more. Uh, we also did the Midnight Crucible, which was 12 hours of training from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And, you know, uh, we always joke that at the Crucible, um, uh, uh, you have to come in and agree to stay for 12 hours and not leave no matter what, unless it's in an ambulance. And a couple reps ago, we had a guy that left, not literally in an ambulance, but he literally went to the hospital, got his, got his leg wrapped up and came back and watched the rest, but he was, he was shot. Um, and then this last time, the midnight one, we had a guy just give up. He just, his spirit, his will to continue left him after about 10 and a half hours. And he, he sneaked out when we weren't, when we weren't watching. So, you know, it's tough. But people can make it through. Mm -hmm. Always, Somebody always um, often doesn't make it to the end. Um, he's a quitter. He's a quitter. And um, gosh, there's so many. And I think that, um, going to the Christmas party last weekend was mm -hmm. super cool. You know, I had a bunch of J-Mackers with me. We hung out. Um, we hung out with a bunch of people from Legacy, went to the event. We ate, we drank, we talked, we watched a bunch of people get their black belts, people I've known for a long time. Um, um, and just take what I just said and multiply it times seven. That was my year. So it was a great martial arts year. I'm really blessed to be a part of that. Great, good question. Thanks. Yeah, I was happy to see you at a lot of those events too. So it's always nice. Um, Hanshi Uh Well, you know, my years are basically always the same. It is, it's a highlight to go to the Christmas dinner that we have so that we can see everybody start peaking in their martial arts. 
But the one thing I would have to say is that uh, um, a thing that was big for me, and some people will, will understand, some will not, is that I got to go and train uh, with Sensei Suino in Eido in um, Michigan. It's, uh, getting myself back into uh, my EI training because I, I was I spent a lot of my time trying to pick up the white crane and now that I have it somewhat under my belt I, I'd like to recontinue or reapply myself into my EI and progress that's exactly. it hard for you sensei to even get into that dojo you put a herculean effort and to getting yourself into the United States and into that dojo. And uh, and you're coming back soon, which is even better. Yeah, yeah. and I'm going with you. And I can't, that's going to be a highlight for <laughs> next year, early next year, <laughs> going in January to JMAC. Yeah, we Love sense it. Like it. That's awesome. Thanks, Sanji. Um, Sanji Benson? Um, I've had a little time to listen. So my three will be relatively quick. Um, the uh you know when i had the the strike happen and i it's tough for me to train when i'm in a busy acting year as much as i want i can train as much as i want but i mean fighting um so i spent august doing all my karate but also 31 jiu-jitsu classes in 31 days and that included a tournament and then a tournament right after and that was a goal i set myself and uh, it worked and it was freaking great i came through it feeling tired but amazing and uh so that I feel really good about. Number two is really broad, but just training with my students. I love going to that club and I love watching them grow. And sometimes it's competition, but really just like rolling up to class and just training. It's just become one of the purest delights. And um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. There's so many ways I could describe why. Um, but honestly, if I'm if I'm going really like, I'm really excited about the Matsumura Challenge myself. You know, I made it to the finals. And even though I got a silver, I think that was arguably my best fight in my time there um, with Sensei Wilfred Surratt. And, and it just felt special. Um, you know, the previous fights were, were pretty quick with against some good competitors. So I felt good about that. But that fight lasted a long time. It was tactical. We hit each other a lot. We both scored a lot on each other that the judges couldn't call because three didn't see it, but we knew we did. A lot of respect. Um, it was a really special fighting moment for me. Um, so those are my three. Nice. I, I remember you at the Matsumura Challenge, I think, um, with the Kata especially. I think you did Gojushiho, right? I did. Or, yeah, that was really cool. Thank you. Thanks, Sensei. Sensei Dolphin? Man, so yes, Matsumura Challenge. I'm really proud of that. A lot of people put a lot of work into that. It was the biggest one we ever did. That's definitely a highlight. The Eido camp, same thing. A lot of work went into that. A lot of people came. And listen, the thing I like about those two things is not one negative comment. Not even one. There's nothing. 570 people came to the Matsumura Challenge and nobody complained about anything. No one. We did this huge idol camp. Everybody just left and was like, that was outstanding. That was do it again next year. Can we come back next year to Matsumura Challenge of the Idol Camp? So that stuff's really, really, really cool. Um listen, it was really fun to jump in a car with Sensuino and Cheyenne and Sydney and Justin and drive to Levy, Quebec. Like that was so much fun. It was such a nice road trip and it was we trained really hard. We trained with good people. My mats were full. I really liked Levy Quebec. I liked Capital Conquest. It was really exciting to see Sensei Copeland get inducted into the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. That's a really high moment for me personally. I know it for all of us, right? Like I'm saying things. We all love that guy. He deserves to be in there. It was really nice to see that. Um, I actually went to Japan this year with Sensei Serino. We didn't mention that. But that was like a crazy outstanding trip. I enjoyed that so much. Um, went to Wyoming personally, not martial arts related, but hiked in the mountains again with some of my best friends. Had a really good time with that. Uh, on a personal level, I want to just change it for a minute. To, um, I'm really happy with the Kitchener Dojo. 
Like I'm so proud of what we're doing here in Kitchener. Um, our membership is growing and growing and growing across all programs. We're probably going to hit like over a hundred students this year. That's not because of me. That's because of you, Drady and Stavros and the other black belts and Sensei Legacy and Sensei Suino and Sensei Benson and everybody just always supporting us and helping us. And we have like, it's just so cool to walk in to a room with like, you know, 37 people lined up from wall to wall and the mirrors are sweating and they're all training. I just really love that. Um, and everybody's going from the dojo to the tournaments, like all these things that we said involve all these people going and supporting them. Um, it's really cool to go to a grading now, a legacy show under grading and see all the belt levels post pandemic being graded seeing yellow belts be graded and green belts get graded and purple belts and brown belts and black belts. And listen, we all held the course and stuck with it where other people drifted away. And uh, I'd say Legacy Sharon Rue is back stronger than ever now post pandemic. Um, so it's really cool to see these gradings and it's just it's really proud to just see all of the belt levels grading and doing well. Um, you know, I, I've done BJJ and I threw myself back into the ring this year a few times and fought. And I feel really good about the way that I fought at the level that I fought. And yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. And uh, the last thing I want to say is, uh, and I know a sense of legacy, you'll, you'll feel the same way about this one, but uh, we have not had the opportunity to see Hunchy Montalvo and like since before the pandemic and on a personal level for me, I really love that guy. And when he walked through the door of the dojo, it was a very emotional feeling for me. I love that man. He's a really good person. He's a big supporter of everything we're doing. And we've always been a big supporter of him. It was really nice to see him and just give him a hug and be around him and his wife, Zulma, is a wonderful lady. So I know that's more than three, but those are my highlights of the year. And this year is a highlight year for me in my life. So, yeah. I was expecting you to get more than three, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Dreamy? What are your What are your ones? Because you asked yeah. the question, you get to answer the question. What about you? Um, it's been a really good year. Yeah, I guess with martial arts, like this is my first full year in martial arts. So um, experiencing it from January to December has been really nice. Lots of events, but... The biggest thing for me is I just, I feel so connected to the community. Um, and of course that's Kitchener, but that's St. Thomas and Toronto and JMAC and um, everybody else that I've, that I've met this year and, and gotten to know. So um, that's a big part of just making my year as fulfilling as it's been. Um, and I, I will say the biggest highlight for me is I got to go to India and see my grandma. So best year, nice. greatest one. Can't wait for the next time. Yeah. Vidi, you're not my well, student. Awesome. I don't want to overstep here, but if I were you, one of my martial arts highlights that would exceed all the rest is the founder of a style saying wow to me and that my kata are a perfect or at least pure exemplification of the style. <laughs> I died for the highlight. rest of my life. That but was he never highlight. said he never said that to me, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's absolutely a highlight. I um yeah, I, I don't I don't think I fully realized what happened until until much later. But yeah, that meant a lot, of course. Great question, Dree. And thanks. thanks for helping us. So I know you've stepped up in a big way to help us. So thank you so much for helping Robert and jumping in there doing the work that you're doing. Of course, happy to do it. It was really nice to see you all tonight. Nice to see you too. Bye. Um, so Hanchi Legacy, you had two questions, one about Kata and one, um, no, I think that was it, right? That's the last one we have, right? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, uh, we talk sometimes about, um, the martial arts world being turned over to the Olympics because they sort of placed, first of all, I like to say anyone would like to be an Olympian. I mean, in their right minds, right? So I'm not cutting them down. I'm just looking 
at um, the source of martial arts and the way that the source is today. So um, I think that uh, at the beginning of uh, the Olympics, um, sort of led in the sports side of the events. And um, martial arts should always remain in the traditional, in the hands of the traditional people. But they, in a sense, have changed martial arts for the better. Like now, when I go to tournaments and I watch all the young, the good young guys, say the guys from, uh, what's the name of Silent Tiger, the way they do kata and everything. And when I watch the Olympic cut is done by the ladies or the guys, and then they do the group bunkai at the end, uh, I find that that is giving uh, the classical kata a different shape and a different timing. So um, I'm just wondering how, how everybody else thought about that. Are the Olympics now better for the martial arts as to um, first of all, first thing I want to say, uh, the other thing I want to say is that karate or martial arts are not a sport. They're a classical art. That means, how they described it, I looked it up a little bit, that 90% of the time, 90%, you will be defended. 90, it will work for you 90% of the time. So that that's as good as it gets. Nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. But if your art defends you 90% of the time under normal situations, that that is an art, it's no longer a sport. So that's what I'm saying. Now, is the sport giving back to us? Because I, I tell you, when I watched those young people do katas, it was nothing like uh, I did. So that's my question. Uh, anybody, how about uh, Sensei Suino? Yeah. I think the devil's in the details. I love watching the kind of kata that people are doing now in the Olympics and a lot of the world competitions. It's athletic. It's dynamic. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, compelling to watch. So that gets more people into karate, which is probably overall a good thing. Um, it adds athleticism. I'm a fan of that. I think uh, it's possible. You know, some people do martial arts and they they kind of just do the martial arts, but they leave the athleticism out. I think that's, to me, in my personal life, that works better together. And I think there's a relationship between better stances, more speed, more intensity, and fighting. Having said that, I'm not sure that all the people that do those great kata are also great fighters. Pretty sure they're not. There seems to be a big difference, right? Like, for example, Sean, you made reference to your recent silver medal, right? That's a very specific way because of the rule set in part, right? A very specific way of fighting. And listen, I'm the least qualified to speak on karate on, on the people on this call. But um, um, I see a big difference in that kind of fighting and a lot of the kata that's done in the same tournaments, right? Not necessarily 100% overlap between the people. Net, net, I love it. I really love the fact that a lot of really old Okinawan karate is coming to the forefront in the last couple of matches. A lot of Ryu Ryu has come forward, which never used to, you never used to hear about it or see it. A lot of the guys are winning with that. So, you know, I like it. Um, but I think that there's uh, there's limits to it. Who next, Sensei? Randy. I hate that it's subjective. That's the thing I don't like about uh, Olympic karate. And I don't like that on my insider perspective, man, I don't want to mention names here, but... Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but I know I know judges that are like IOC rated who are shitty at karate, and they're the ones who are judging the people who are better at karate than them, and that's where I have a bit of a problem. But listen, 
like you watch Sanchez sensei or Sakura sensei walk out and do a kata. Like their Zan Shin is impeccable. Their uniform is perfect. Like their technique is outstanding. And I love it. I love to watch it. I'll watch it all day long. I'll, I'll watch them do it over and over again. And I find it super inspiring. Um, I hate the bunkai portion where they have to demonstrate bunkai. I think it's bullshit and just pure fantasy bunkai. I don't think it's like, that's where it's like, just becomes like a puppet show of entertainment and not like, you know, when you see the group kata, right? Three people, and then they have to demonstrate bunkai and their, their athleticism is great, but, and their techniques are nice, but their interpretation of the kata, I think is a fantasy and stupid <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, how do you really feel yeah well that's how i feel about it, <laughs> right? Love it. um but uh uh and as the Sino said the devil's in the details right so you mentioned the silent tiger uh group sensei you know you watch michael street or declan or ryan feist do kata and it's going to be like that type of kata but go ahead and try and grab a hold of them. They're going to fucking beat your ass into another level that you didn't expect to get beaten into. Like they're tough. They come in from a fighter's mentality that also, then they understand that the Kata is going to help them be a better fighter. And that's why they pour themselves into it. So going back to your question about, are they giving back? Yeah. They're giving back a lot of inspiration. Uh, the people who just do Kata, but and I don't know all of them. Maybe some of them are great fighters too, but I think to be a complete martial artist, you have to be able to do your kata and your fighting and do your bunkai. Um, yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question or just vomited a whole bunch of stuff out about Olympic kata. <laughs> yeah. All right, Sean. Um, for me, you know, I don't mind the subjective nature of the kata one bit. You know, I think about one of the big ones of the winters, the figure skating, one of the big ones of the summers, the gymnastics. And I think it's really cool that, you know, average people all of a sudden are invested in these routines and they are judged. And I think that's just fine. We do that with our own. And I, I really, um, I think the kata growth, like when I watch these kata, they're excellent. I'm blown away. I can't do the kata like that. And I think they're doing it with balance and poise maybe a little extra screaming, but it's really good. I will say this about the fighting though. I have a problem with anything that pits a person against a person and has rules like that about contact. Because I think that in that one event where the guy knocked the other out, I think it diminished how people perceive karate. And I'll tell you why. If you look at, um, I have a student tomorrow fighting in what's called a kick-like tournament. The rule is 70% contact. Well, George Foreman's 70% is different than Ali's. And then do you measure each person's chin ability to take a hit? That that guy could have gotten knocked down with something that wouldn't have knocked down another competitor and maybe not equal to DQ. So the problem for me is when you have a pullback from full contact, it's really hard to advance a deadly activity in the eyes of the public when they're seeing the guy who gets hurt be the winner. And so I think that didn't help. And I think that's a problem that's inherent when you have contact rules. Um, it's great that we do for our tournaments. It's great that we do when we're fighting in the club, but I don't think on a world level, when you're trying to show the effectiveness of something to have a, you know, you can sprint as fast as you can only 70%. You'd never hear that. And with fighting, it gets complicated. And I understand why it's complicated, but I'm not sure that fighting helped karate. At the yeah, end. but those rules weren't applied properly. The rules were there for the other guy to win. They just didn't apply them. And right. Right. Because there's a rule there that if you launch yourself into somebody's technique and get hurt, it's your fault, not the person right. who did the technique. And that guy launched himself into that guy's roundhouse kick and got knocked out. And if he had any class, he would have stood up and gave the guy the gold medal and just 100%. said, hey, You here, if you're a real martial artist, you would have said, I threw myself onto your foot. You got disqualified. Here's the gold medal. Please give me the silver. And I'd tell that to his face if he was here. And maybe he'd knock me out, but I don't care. I'd still tell him. 
Oh, totally. And like with the running, if you step a foot out of your box on passing a baton, you'll lose as well. So it's not like there isn't totally minute things, but when it's just you against a clock or you against the other person in the clock, it tends to come out pretty decently. What do you think, Hanchi? Well, I hate to say this, uh, but um, lenders uh, honor and <laughs> Funny, I should say that first. Honor and um, representing your country, it leaves room for a little of I'll do anything to win, up to and including cheating. It happened to me and one of my students that I privately teach. I'll just tell you a real short story, not name anyone. We went to this tournament, which was not a, uh, what, are, what are the, on, Olympic rules or whatever those rules are. And when it got to the very end, my student went last. But it was funny because uh, I wondered what happened. All the referees got up and walked. And the head referee started talking to all the corner judges, which it's supposed to be an unsolicited vote on who they think is best. And at the end, the head referee had turned around and said, that person wins, pointed to his student. There was there was no flag showing. He talked to the people and my student lost against his. I never said anything because it wasn't the um, tournament guy's fault. He wasn't there watching it. So, because if they win tournaments and that, I know it has to be certain tournaments but they get points and they get points to go and represent Canada or the United States or Germany whoever it is so um, they should look in their own backyard a little bit sometimes like you know uh, you take the and I'm not speaking against the Russians I'm just saying that you know they did some doping so you know what I mean they'll go some people will go to allegedly <laughs> Allegedly. Okay, yes. I think the Olympic team was pissing so much steroids. Citizens like on the Volga River were getting steroids from the water they were drinking. Yeah. Anyway, anyway I will never forgive that person. Hmm. Thanks, Anchi. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say thank you to Robert Shlumsky, Justin Shea, Andre Sadashev, Alden Adair, Jesse Belay Vitao, Sidney Dolphin, Josh Kitchens, Christiana Landol, Daniel J. Holland, Judy Guliani, who we heard from tonight, and Stavros Tavrulius. They are the behind the scenes. They are the makers of this show's um, you know, profile in the public. When you see it, it's because they're creating those uh, those ads and platforms and they run the uh the computer tonight. So we're so grateful for them. We don't have a show without them. And um I'm not going to take the last word. We do have a guest, Paul Rose, next week, which we're really excited about. But um, I'm going to I'm going to just randomly throw the last word to you, Sensei Suino, to say good night. Well, everybody, the end of the year is coming. It's been an amazing year for martial arts. It's been an amazing year for most of us and our families. Keep it up. Remember the holidays. Remember the folks that aren't as fortunate. But most of all, get your ass in the dojo and keep getting your ass in the dojo because nothing gets done with a little bit of hard work. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.